I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Robin Grossinger. He's a senior scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute, where he co-directs with Letitia Grenier, SFEI's Resilient Landscapes Program. For over 20 years, Robin has analyzed how California landscapes have changed since European contact, using these data to guide landscape scale restoration strategies. He's the author of Napa Valley Historical Ecology Atlas and has been recognized with a local hero award from Bay Nature Magazine and the Carla Bard Bay Education Award from the Bay Institute and the Aquarium of the Bay. So first off, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. Thanks, Derek. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about the San Francisco Bay and the estuaries and first what what were they like at early contact and um, and then sort of trace the history to what they're like now yeah um, yeah happy to it's a uh, yeah um, it's an ama- obviously it was an amazing place um, and while you know we can't go back there uh, it's amazing that the documents that we have um, from the early explorers um, Spanish Mexican American documents um, early maps uh, descriptions written by travelers. We, we've been able to weave together a picture of what it was like in the early 1800s before um, before most of the you know, subsequent impacts happened. So when it was both, you know, more like it had been for centuries beforehand. So uh, it, it, uh, the bay was, uh, was um, characterized by the dominant thing about San Francisco Bay was the tidal marshlands that were around 300 square miles of marshes uh, at the edge of the bay, salt marshes, um, representing almost half of the whole state's total wetlands, um, tidal wetlands. Um, so it was this massive enclosed estuary that really had unique continental scale um, wetland habitat. And uh, and these wetlands um, were fronted by um, tidal mudflats and actually 27 miles of sandy beach uh, which we had forgotten about, lost and forgotten about um, until until research recently. Um, so we had beaches along the edges, particularly in the Central Bay. But the tidal marshlands um, covered about, um, and the tidal mudflats were really almost half of the bay, size of the bay. It's an interesting thing now, the bay, um, most, almost all of that area has been lost, the um, inner tidal area. And so what we've been left with is is largely just the, deeper water portion of the bay it was kind of in the, in the middle as we diked off or filled most of the edges and what that means is that we we lost um, kind of the most productive uh, wetland area and um, some of the amazing things I think about about how the system what it was like to live around the bay in um, back in the day is that the bay between a low tide like a very low tide and a quite high tide the bay could ex- um, contract and expand almost half because as it as the tide rose it would could, could spread across the mudflats and the marshes and the bay would effectively get much wider and so right now we see water mostly go up and down with the tides but it used to go in and out it would spread out across hundreds you know, thousands hundreds several hundred thousand acres um, on a big high tide so um, it was really this sort of living, growing, expanding, and contracting system. So, um, and then if we kind of look around the perimeter of the bay, uh, we would see uh, these largely low uh, meadowlands or grasslands, uh, um, wildflower meadows around the perimeter of the bay, um, a lot of fairly flat, uh, seasonally flooded um, wetlands, uh, amazing wildflower displays, um, shallow waters that the waterfowl and, um, and amphibians would use in the winter and spring. Um, and there would be these little ribbons of trees, the creeks coming down the hill, from the hills across the valley towards the bay. Um, most of these valleys and plains around the edge of the bay didn't have that many trees until you got a little more toward the north and south where you had the Great Valley Oak Savannas. And so these were those grand, um, largely valley oaks that were uh, kind of dominated Santa Clara Valley and Napa Valley and Sonoma, 
and Walnut Creek, um, and then on the Central Valley. Uh, so scattered trees, grand, beautiful uh, savannas um, that were described as park-like because they had this sort of low meadows underneath them from indigenous burning and these, these big, beautiful trees. So those um, within in the East Bay tended to, I think because of the, the slightly salty air excluded the Valley Oaks, was more of really an open open meadows and plains, except for you had, all around the bay where you had um, high groundwater or springs, you would have willow groves, which are kind of a special habitat type that, that were you know, a few acres or 10 or even, even more, 100 acres in size, but relatively small compared to the whole area. We didn't have a lot of dense forest in the lowlands here because it's so dry in the summer. But um, these would be these in the freshwater wetlands would often be around them. Would be little oases, kind of spotted in the valleys and on the edge of the bay. These are the centers of biodiversity, um, kind of the places where wildlife could get water in the summer. Um, really high value areas. And then, um, and then a really unique spot uh, in the East Bay was the land of oaks, the Oakland, which became Oakland, which was unusual because there was a sandy soil outcrop there, um, which is actually related to the dunes of San Francisco that uh, supported live oaks, a kind of unusual big grove of live oaks that was right up at the edge of the bay in downtown, downtown Oakland and, and Alameda. And so that was a kind of a landmark in East Bay, this big, huge grove of oaks. So then, And then as you continue up, you would then, of course, get into the hills and your coastal live oak woodlands and in some places redwoods, um, grasslands. And those are the habitats where we at least see some, some resemblance, some, some semblance of that in, in the present day, um, although modified. But as you come down into the flats, you know, where people, most, most people live, and then the bay, yeah, tremendously altered. So I have a few questions. One is, can you talk a little bit about both you, you've talked about biomes which is great and i want to ask you more about that in a second but can you talk a little bit about the uh animal presence i remember reading somewhere that there was a spanish explorer in the bay area who said that uh it looked like the bay was paved to use his word with sea lions so can you talk about sea lions whales um delta smelt uh salmon uh, can uh-huh. you talk about some of the some and grizzly bears too? Can you talk about some of the the, the animals who lived there? Yeah, the um, right there was an abundance of wildlife. I think that's that's evident. Um, you know, from yeah, the grizzly bears. There are quite a few accounts of grizzly bears, um, pronghorn and tule elk, and um, the famous uh, skies dark with waterfowl. Um, People do say things like that. I mean, that seems sounds apocryphal, but there are a number of quotes of you'd scatter, you'd surprise um, a flock, and it would just be a massive um, bunch of birds that you know, go on for a long time, a flock. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the rivers. The um, It's funny, we think of these, these creeks are really quite small, but um, many of them had steelhead, uh, you know, substantial runs of steelhead coming up them most years. Um, and some of the bigger ones, like Napa River, um, had salmon, you know, had Chinook salmon. Um, some even maybe had coho. So there was, um, you know, there was a tremendous diversity. There were shorebirds. Um, yeah, the, the fish in the bay, some yeah, whales, you know, show up in some accounts. Um, yeah, the shellfish, um, a major, major staple. Uh, migratory songbirds, uh, you know, you name it, there was, um, you know, a tremendous amount of, of biodiversity and then, you know, just abundance of those those things. And I want to go back to the mudflats, um, in part because it's not a biome I've thought about very much. I remember when I was a kid, we were up in Alaska and saw what you were describing of a low tide where the mud seemed to go on forever. And first off, can you... What happened to the mudflats? Was it mainly dredged out to make it deeper, or was that built on for the city? So was the bay actually – do you see what I'm asking? First off, is that yeah. question. Second, 
Uh, who lives in mud fats? You said that they were that they were uh, productive, but but productive for for whom? Is it? Cl- I don't. I have no idea. Clams, water birds. Who lives in mud flats? Right. So so there's invertebrates in there. There's yeah, clams and small worms and polychaetes and yeah, little bugs for. Um, what's more visible is the waterfowl or, or the shorebirds that, that um, feed on the mud flats. So I think that that's you're right. They're kind of invisible in, in, in a lot of senses because they're underwater half the time and um, don't look like a whole lot when they are visible. There's a bunch of mud, but yeah, they're really productive. There's also algae, um, and so they're really central for migratory shorebirds. They, they're very productive, and they you, you'll see them. Taking advantage of mud flats, um, you know, following them, following the tide, to follow the edge of the mud flats, and um, yeah, foraging out there. So yeah, very valuable habitat, even though maybe less um, less recognized. And it it has um, it has persisted more than some because it's a little further out to the bay and less um, easy to fill and develop. So. Um, but, but yeah, a fair amount of mudflats were developed, particularly in the more urbanized part of the bay. And then, um, and then some of them got, uh, as more sediment comes in, they can turn into marshes, which is actually not necessarily a bad thing. But then you need to be ideally getting more mudflats back in the lower parts, uh, in the lower elevations of the bay. So um, it kind of brings up the whole sediment cycle. Um, you know, and so I think one of our fears about mudflats and marshes is whether we have enough sediment. Um, in the bay, dirt essentially in the water, because um, that's what feeds um, the marshes and mudflats and allows them to, to maintain themselves, and then in particular maintain themselves as sea level rises, um, which has been rising naturally um, for thousands of years, but is now speeding up because of climate change. So um, the delivery of mud, flat, of mud, of sediment from creeks to the bay is, is, is the other factor in terms of mudflats. Surviving. So, that, well, that brings up kind of, I, I think, a neat point about this landscape that we're, we're exploring, which is just how, I think, to me, how wonderfully, exquisitely calibrated it was to our to our climate and landscape. Um, when you think about it, uh, it, it's a challenging environment, the, the California Mediterranean climate. You know, the the, the um, you know, you have this annual drought, essentially, of six, six, seven months, um, where it generally doesn't rain much at all. And you have really variable a- rainfall. Some areas it rains a lot, some areas it rains a little. And, um, and then you have a bay that was rising gradually. Um, sea level rises naturally since the last ice age. And, um, and so you think about how this, how this landscape, how these, these habitats, how this life was calibrated to that. Um, and some of the adaptations, like uh, the steelhead, are really fascinating because they have the ability to stay. Most salmon have to go, um, you know, go out each year to to, to the um, to the ocean. Um, but steelhead have have the option to choose when they go out, and so they can stay. If it's not a good water year, they can stay up in the watershed as rainbow trout, and then come out on a on a you know, in a year when these small creeks are more amenable to to swimming out to the bay. So many of these creeks weren't necessarily that good um, corridors because in a dry year. But you have, um, you know, really you know, these big, beautiful fish calibrated to the to the kind of dynamism and variability of the landscape. And then similarly, I think about the oak trees and just how remarkable that really was the main tree out on these open plains where it's so hot and dry was the valley oak. And, and it had the ability to persist, not only persist, but create this huge structure, canopy, you know, tremendous engine for biodiversity with very little water, and um, and just and you know dealing with a really challenging climate, um, you know, challenging conditions. So you had these these adaptations. You can also think about um, you know the. the Variability. Another way of thinking about the variability was the acorn woodpeckers, um, which are dependent on acorns. They they would rely on several different types of oak trees because oak trees do better. Different species of oak trees tend to produce 
good crops of acorn in different water years. So if it's really dry, um, maybe the valley oak, valley oak acorn crop fails, but the live oak produces well. So, or in a different type of year, blue oak does well. So you had um, this heterogeneity and this this um, complexity diversity, which gives us kind of confers resilience on the landscape and allowed species to adapt to this incredibly variable system. So I think that's, and that's of course, as we think about in the future, how do we give bring resilience back and make things uh, have the best chance of survival with climate change? We start we look to those sorts of um, patterns and processes. Well, I want to talk about that in a moment. I want to I want to respond to something you said here that just is is this is one of the things that I absolutely love about nature. And I just read this last week that um, hippos in Africa um, are important to stopping blooms of toxic algae in in lakes because. They eat a tremendous amount of, uh, of plants that have high concentrations of silica, and then they poop it out, and then for a reason that I don't remember, the silica inhibits the blooms of toxic algae. And I love that you use the word calibrated. They're all – one more quick story is that I was sitting with a friend of mine who's a fisheries biologist. We're looking out at the ocean, and he tells me that uh, sharks having rough skin allows them to swim faster than if they had smooth skin because of the difference between turbulent and laminar flow. And I turn to him and I say, so this is all so extraordinary and wondrous. Do you believe in like some sort of intelligent force, you know, creating the entire, you know, some sort of creation force? And his answer, I still love years later, which is he said there is great intelligence in time, <laughs> and I just I I I love that. And there is there's this great intelligence, or great you can call it calibration. You can call it whatever you want. I don't care. There is this great something in this long term adaptation of this long term dance between creatures and their habitat. Yeah, that's right. Right, and it, it it is always hard to imagine how that could have happened through natural selection and just all the little mistakes being selected properly. But it is time that makes it makes it particularly possible because yeah, over all that time you got this exquisite calibration to the landscape, which itself is always changing. But um, you know, and nature is always kind of catching up with that, and and but then shaping it as well. One of the stories that, that um, you know, is real pertinent to us today that, that is fascinating to me along those lines of calibration is just the tidal marshes and how they, um, you know, how diff- they need to be at just the right elevation in relation to the tide. So they're not flooded too much or else the plants will drown or too little, in which case they'll dry out and won't get the, the dirt and nutrients they need. So how do they find that, that edge? That perfect elevation when the sea level is changing, because as the since the last ice age, sea level has been rising, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Well, there's a neat feedback mechanism where whereby when the marshes get if, sea, if the seas rise a little faster, the marshes get flooded a little bit more, and more, more sediment gets deposited because more they get more water more often, so more dirt falls out of that, and then they, that makes them grow up a little higher. And then they get flooded less, so it uh, so then their growth slows down and matches to match sea level. Also, they can just grow, um, you know, vegetatively more when they're flooded when they have more water. So there's um there's a really neat dance right there between the the marshes and, and the ocean and ocean levels. And so then, yeah, these are in the some extent I feel like you know this research is fascinating. And kind of wondrous, but it also these are the this is the um, you know the natural resources, the legacy, the inheritance of this region that was created by all of that time, all these systems working together that that we want to learn from and figure out how that um, 
and then how that can be sustained and drawn upon in the future, because we've sort of squandered some of that inheritance, um, yeah, to say the least. Um, but much of that is actually still those processes are still, you know, those genetics, those, um, you know, the, the amazing kind of abilities encoded in all these species. Um, most of them haven't gone extinct. Um, and many could be, many of these kind of processes could be reestablished more if we tried. So before we get to that, and before we get to, I want to come back to the to the sediment uh, cycle again, or in a moment, or in a moment, because you mentioned I want to talk a little bit more about that. But before you go, those I, I want to say something sort of silly, which is that I've sometimes thought if I could choose to live anywhere on the planet based solely on the uh, biome pre-contact, I've sometimes thought it might be the Bay Area. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you would, if, if that would be one of your early choices for where, just based on climate and uh, natural fecundity, if that's if that might be one place you would choose. Well, it's a pretty good choice. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. Because um, yeah, and, and that's reflected in the indigenous um, you know, settlement population, who was one of the more dense, densely populated areas. Uh, because it's such a great place to live. And, um, the, you know, why? Well, it, it, it's a relatively mild climate, so the winters aren't that difficult. Um, the, some of the resources that are around, um, all year, in particular, um, the bay, you know, the bay being there and the tidal mudflats and the, the marshes and so the, the, um, you know, the, the, the shellfish was a tremendous resource that you could really rely on year-round. And we had all these other other resources, like the acorns, um, tremendous crop that then you could actually store, um, the salmon and steelhead seasonally, uh, the seeds and um, from the, the meadowlands, um, and then, yeah, all the wildlife. So tremendous amount of resources. Uh, you know, the... Um, the little grizzly bears, that would have been challenging. <laughs> grizzly bears are kind of the top of the top of the food chain. Um, mountain lions, you know, I guess, but probably not as big of a big of a threat. But, you know, there weren't alligators. <laughs> um, you know, the marshes are pretty relatively, you know, when we do research in marshes, you know, well, what would that be like if there were alligators? That would be very different. Um, so relatively, probably, rel- you know, n- not as difficult in terms of some of the... Um, you know, dangerous wildlife. Uh, and yeah, this is really reflecting the diversity um, and kind of the, the small settlement footprints of the tribes. Um, you know, there were several dozen tribes um, around the edge of the bay, and they were considered distinctive enough that they had had different languages. Um, so it gives you a sense of how, um, how local and long term um, those cultural patterns were to, to have that much diversity. And, and that's like what you could sustain too in a relatively small area between the hills and the bay. Um, there was just uh, there was so much to work with. So yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll I'll go with that. <laughs> so let's go back. Thank you. Let's go back to sediment. And I don't think people, I don't think most people think much about sediment. And if they have thought about it at all, they may have heard that. You know, Louisiana is disappearing in part because the Mississippi is not allowed to, to dump as much sediment as it was. But we don't, you know, soil is the basis of terrestrial life. And um, what, I mean, can you talk about the importance of sediment to, to in general and specifically to the Bay Area? Yeah, well, you're right. It's one of the you know, main resources for for life and the, um, most plants grow in soil and, and most crops and, uh, and, and the, the fertility of soil is, is such a valuable resource in terms of what, what can be produced food-wise and ecosystem-wise. So that's that's sort of a huge issue um, nationally and internationally. Um, it's interesting that it even translates into, you know, not just our agricultural lands and, you know, compaction of soil and loss of soil fertility, but 
the importance of soil um, for wetlands on, on the coasts of you know of the world. So yeah, that I think the story about New Orleans is somewhat somewhat known in the the, the wetlands of the basin Mississippi Mississippi River, but that applies to many coastal wetlands, um, if not most, if not all um, around the world. Um, the the need for sediment and um, the appropriate supply um, from for the the um, so sediment can be carried in water, you know, muddy water, um, which comes in through rivers and rains, um, brown rivers. That's um, incredibly valuable. Um, sometimes it can erode too much sediment from the land, but there's also a natural amount that um, typically takes place, and that's what delivers. Um, the dirt to coastal wetlands that need that, and also beaches um, to persist, and as it gets washed back up on high, high tides. So that, um, and as I was saying before, that's a pretty remarkable process that gives gives these coastal features kind of amazing resilience, um, the ability to adapt to different sea levels, to, to move, to, to grow when they need to. But it's limited, of course, by whether there's enough sediment in the water. And so one of the biggest challenges for the bay um, and other coastal systems is the amount, you know, if that's out of sync, the amount of sediment in the water with the rate of sea level rise. And unfortunately, we're going kind of in the wrong direction. The rate of sea level rise is increasing um, through the course of this century. Uh, and the amount of sediment in the water is actually de- decreasing. And that's because of, largely because of reservoirs, which capture um, the sediment from, the, kind of unintentionally trap it uh, as they capture water. And it's not actually ideal because that fills up the reservoir, makes it less usable. But um, no one has really come up with a good way to, to keep that sediment moving through into the creeks, where it's also important for, um, you know, bars and flats and um, the processes that rivers want to do. Look down at the bottom where you want to get um, the dirt to build your marshes. So, this is interesting, and um, a lot of the work at, at our institute and scientists along the bay are trying to understand the, how much sediment do we have in the bay, how much do we need for the wetlands that we think we need, and where might that come from. And where it traditionally came from, what were, I mean, let's sort of follow a a little bit of soil. So it, it rains, and um, whatever soil was not held by roots of plants might get rolled into a stream, and then the faster the stream goes, the more soil it can carry, right? And so that's one of the reasons that a reservoir, a, a dam will uh, remove sediment below the dam is because the water slows and the sediment falls out. Is, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And so often at the beginning of the reservoir where where water comes in, you'll see a little wetland there because the, the water slows down, as you said, and it builds up a little wetland delta at the edge of the, the um, reservoir, the opening entrance to it. But it's interesting, the, uh, that thought, then that's the same process that happens where wetlands are built because, of course, you know, everyone, you know, where you see wetlands, coastal wetlands, tidal marshes, is in the the kind of um, the, the shallow, more protected areas, right? It's in the um, the embayments, the the coves, are where where wetlands tend to build up, where the wave energy is is not as high, and essentially the water slows down, like you're describing, and when it slows down and sort of pauses there, that's where the um, the dirt can kind of settle out, at least a little bit of it on each each tide. Well, one of the things this makes clear is that um, although it's you can do all sorts of things to restore a local place, it's it is simply true also that uh, places are interconnected, such that what happens high on the Sacramento River will still affect the San Francisco Bay. Is that is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, right, the recognition that we can't do everything just by protecting individual spots. Um, that's important, the reserves, um, and protecting places. But 
it really is the processes that need to support those, and, and that means kind of following those processes, whether they be wildlife corridors or, yeah, the flow of sediment along a creek or, um, you know, things like that that, that are essentially going to determine the success. So, yeah, we, we shouldn't really go building wetlands if we don't think they have those processes supporting them that allow them to persist. So you've, you've done a wonderful job of talking about what the bay was like and some of the concerns. Can you talk a little bit more? Can you bring us up to today and how is the bay doing? And then after that, we'll talk about resilience and we'll talk about sort of positive projects. But for now, can you talk about sort of a state of the bay? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the positive thing, this is a positive story in many ways in our region. You know, the bay probably hit its low point in the 70s or 80s uh, when before wetland restoration really started in earnest and when the water quality was worse um, for the Clean Water Act and you know, so streaming plant upgrades. So the um, so it's been a pretty remarkable turn in, um, you know, in the fate of the bay in the past generation where, so we got down, so we had around 200,000 acres of tidal marsh that had been reduced to about 40,000 acres. And in the last um, decade or so, we've restored, um, I can't remember the numbers exactly offhand, but um, several thousand acres. Um, so we've re reversed that curve and restored thousands of acres of tidal marshland and acquired um, tens of thousands of acres, which are in the process of being restored. So, and we set a goal in 1999 of getting that 200,000 acres, which had gone down to 40, back up to 100, to essentially half. And we are making really good progress towards that as, as a community. So, there, um, so there have been a tremendous, so the bay is, is, has a lot of habitats that it didn't have, um, that had lost for, you know, even maybe a century, um, in places. So, and, and one of the, you know, amazing things is that when, Generally speaking, when we restore a tidal wetland um, or a river, um, the species come back. Uh, so uh, a lot of waterfowl and shorebirds and fish have, have you know, returned in force when we've restored wetlands in the bay. So there's been really a, a renaissance of, um, you know, uh, of ecology and wildlife around the bay. And the bay, you know, had been getting squished smaller and smaller and smaller from you know, 1850 to the to you know 1970 or so, and now it's been gradually given more space to get back some of that intertidal zone that I talked about, the 300 square miles that was was you know almost completely gone. So that's pretty exciting, and um, you know, and it, it's also paralleled by a lot of river and creek restoration, um, Napa River. Um, Similarly, Napa River has been restored quite substantially, and steelhead and salmon have come back in bigger numbers. Uh, there's been many other creeks that have, have gotten restoration. Those beaches I mentioned that have been lost and even forgotten about. Um, we were excited when we discovered the 27 miles of beach, and even more so when we started realizing that those could be restored in some places, and that that's where some of the Probably some of the important endangered species habitat or rare species, like rare plant species, were found out on those beaches. And um, so there's been some beach restoration efforts actually tied into um, climate change resilience as well. Um, and yeah, it goes on um, the oaks. We talk about the, the valley oaks, the beautiful trees you know, across our valleys and plains. Uh, there's been, um, we, 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 we have collaborated with a number of organizations on the idea of re-oaking, re-oaking, not really a word, but it seems to work. Um, and so several cities and um, NGOs and Google on its campuses are re-oaking, bringing the oaks back in, in patterns and densities and combinations that are largely based on how they used to be to, to um, bring back some of that biodiversity associated with the oaks. So... There's um there's a lot of positive positive activity and um, you know in the Bay Area and really in coastal California um, our state does our voters do vote for um, 
you know, to invest in the environment. And so there, there has been, you know, a really tremendous amount of restoration and um, preservation of what's left. So that's there, there's a lot of things to, to feel pretty good about, and there's a lot of improvements. Of course, there's a lot of challenges, too. So when you talk about restoring um, both uh, these wetlands, marshes, um, mudflats, beaches, is most of this uh, simply stopping the destruction, or is it more? Do you have to be more proactive? Is it, is it mainly letting nature do what nature does, or, or do you have to? What percentage is, is nature simply fixing right. things, and what percentage is, is you actually having to do whatever physical work? And if you do physical work, what physical work do you have to do? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so yeah, that's the science and the um, art. And, uh, and the, you know, essentially the profession of, of restoration ecology. And I think the, you know, the, the powerful part of, of restoration ecology is that, you know, when done right, you're restoring, you're working with nature, you're working with the processes that, that create and maintain an oak, you know, an, an oak woodland or a, a marsh. So, and so that's, and you're trying to get that sort of on a trajectory where we don't have to do that much because if you do it right, nature should be able to um, take care of it at least mostly um, for the most part. So, you know, that what what is needed to get a system back onto its you know kind of proper trajectory or reestablish that, given all the changes, really varies. And so, in some cases. You know, it might be as simple as opening up the levee, the little wall that held out the tides from a tide, former tidal marshland, letting the tides back in, and the dirt will come in, the tides, you know, the water will come in and go up and down on the right schedule because that's controlled by the moon. You can't really mess that up. And then the plants will find their way and the, and the wildlife will follow. That, surprisingly, actually is the case a fair amount of the time if the elevation is just right. But often, the elevation isn't, isn't quite right, so we may have to bring in some dirt to recover the marsh back to the right elevation because it's lost that, because it either subsides, it sort of shrinks, or because sea level has gone up since. So there often is some level of engineering or um, you know, uh, planting or design. It's... Um, there's a fair amount of work that often needs to go into it to essentially to recover from what may have been a century of mistreatment and, uh, you know, kind of altering of, of the landscape. So, but, you know, at the same time, I'm also kind of amazed at how many things just restore themselves by themselves. Like, there's a fair amount of beaches around San Francisco Bay that we didn't have anything to do with. They were, the original beaches were destroyed Landfill was built out, a freeway was built out into the bay, you know, thousands of feet, a mile. And then a new beach formed on the outside of that because the processes remained intact and they found the right spot where sand settled and built up a beach. Similarly, you know, as people know who live in an area that still has some oaks, um, if you, it seems that if you have a critical mass of oak trees left, and that supports a critical mass of scrub jays um, and squirrels, the um, essentially the savanna, the oak woodland will try to recreate itself as the scrub jays bury the acorns and they'll start popping up. And so, you know, to a certain extent, these processes are somewhat irrepressible. They, um, you know, I find that nature is always trying to recreate itself, trying to trying to do its thing. And so, it is true to a certain extent. It is getting out of the way. I mean, this is why we have to pave potholes and repaint our house and um, you know everyone knows like if you let things go for the, a, a bit of time it, it'll, it'll get retaken by nature so to some extent we're always just constantly holding nature out by all of our activities but then at the same time in the areas where we want to kind of intensively uh, encourage it back we probably have to put in a little effort so we have about 10 minutes left and before we get to the uh, benefits of restoration and also how people 
can help either there or elsewhere with restoration. Um, what would be a specific restoration project that you're either the most surprised by or proud of or excited about or just what what is one specific restoration project that would that just thrills you the most? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Well, one that um, one that I've been involved in that is not the biggest or most dramatic, but I think is is one of the most intriguing and kind of uh, fulfilling is. Um, a small retention basin in in the South Bay in Mountain View, and so that means it was a when this part of Mountain View, kind of close to the bay, was uh, developed, um, they put in a, a you know, dug out a several acre in size um, basin to catch stormwater so the areas wouldn't flood. And uh, this was in the 80s, and as an example of the accidental restoration of nature. Just being irrepressible, that um, that basin rapidly recreated one of the lost willow groves of that area. Um, you know, groundwater was high enough, willows found their way there, um, and it became a little willow grove, which has become a really important little biodiversity hotspot. And then, um, but it's still really small and narrow, and not really, um, you know, it's still a, a shadow of of what these features used to be. And so um, a neat project that's happened recently is a bunch of environmental groups, the city and Google, one of the landowners in that area, actually have expanded that um, the retention basin um, in this case for ecological reasons to make it bigger and better, more robust habitat. And it actually is happening by taking out parking places. Um, in an area that just has, you know, a massive um, kind of over proportion of, of parking, of pavement. So it's a, um, and then you know, very quickly the willows have expanded and all these native plants are flourishing and a much greater diversity of, um, of, of plant communities was planted around the edge with oaks and cottonwoods. And it's a, uh, it's an example to me of how, in a relatively small space in our urbanized areas, we can, um, you know, low diet a little bit, um, reduce the area for cars, increase the area for nature, and just create these really amazing places for wildlife and people um, because it's got trails and it's uh, really accessible, and but it's big enough that it, it can actually have integrity as a wildlife habitat. Um, so. That, you know, neotropical migrant songbirds stop there, and you get frogs and you know all kinds of um, neat stuff. So that's one of um, my my favorite projects. I mean, we also you know have helped with these wonderful big tidal marsh restoration projects that are hundreds of acres in size. And those are those are critical, and those are sort of our big things and uh, the rivers. And, but I think it's also really exciting for people to do stuff in the areas where they live and work and kind of bring nature into the city and these, these kind of um, these little nodes. Um, and that's sort of maybe one of the newer frontiers of, of restoration ecology is what can we do in those kind of places because otherwise we're never going to get some of the habitats that were, um, you know, that were out in the valleys and plains too. Or, or we can, and also it gives us closer access to nature. In our daily lives. We have <clears throat> now we have seven or eight minutes left, and can so so we have two. And I'm sorry that we that that I asked questions such that we got short shrift to these. But but the two big questions left are one. So can you talk a little bit more about the importance of restoration? Um, and then also, if somebody lives in Los Angeles and wants to do restoration, or somebody lives first off, if somebody lives in the Bay Area and wants to assist in your efforts, what do they do? And second, if somebody lives in Topeka, Kansas, or Galveston, Texas, or anywhere else, and they're interested in restoration, what should they do? Yeah, um, well, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that's been neat for me to discover uh, in recent years is. At first, we had to build that picture of what did did our landscape look like. 
But then we started thinking about what did it do, how did it work, what did it do. And um, it's fairly remarkable. You know, of course, you can almost think of it so beautiful as just the, it, it, it was just sitting there looking pretty. But, of course, it, it wasn't. It, it was not just a pretty postcard. It was you know, this um, dynamic, active system that was doing a whole heck of a lot. So um, it becomes relevant as we start looking to how can nature-based solutions help us with some of the challenges that we face um, with climate change, um, with the loss of biodiversity, with heat island effects. So, um, and so these native ecosystems are largely what made the place livable. So, for example, um, when you think about the valley oaks and the oak savannas, um, those are a remarkable um, piece of really living infrastructure that built shade that, um, you know, from a very small footprint, footprint of a tree, built these huge canopies. And that's actually where all, most of the early villages were built, was in the shade of these oak trees, because otherwise it was really hot out there. So they, um, and they did this at a really low cost of water. They used very little water. Um, so, and they actually store a lot of carbon in our biodiversity engines. So now we start looking to those trees as perhaps better options for our urban forest in many cases where we have room um, than some of the trees that we want to grab from um, the East Coast or the Midwest that actually aren't as, as useful here. Similarly, the wetlands and the beaches on the edge of the bay, those, those bordered all of the low-lying areas around the edge of the bay. Um, just because that's the, how the topography works, but they also then effectively protected those areas from high waves and uh, erosion. And so now we actually would like to have those marshes and beaches back um, to protect us from um, rising sea levels and reduce the, um, the energy of those waves when they get to get to the land. Um, you know, even the wildflower meadows, which were kind of the source of like beautiful color and um, beauty. Um, we realized also that that generated the pollinators uh, and supported the pollinators. And so, as we bring wildflowers, this is a neat thing that everyone can do: is that um, it's hard for wildflowers to survive in some of the wildlands because of the annual grasses and all the invasive species. But they often are now doing better in the cities because people are willing to plant them and actually kind of cultivate and tend them, steward them, as indigenous people did. Um, and so we can, and then that provides supports pollinators, which actually can support urban gardens and urban food production. So the, um, so all of these different ecosystems that we talked about probably have a role to play in our, in our lives today, a greater, um, role in terms of their, their, you know, specific, like, services or needs that we have to, to make our cities livable and functional. So in addition to simply just supporting biodiversity and the ecosystems as a whole upon which we depend. So I find it really exciting to think about how do we weave this nature back into the landscape, you know, through um, kind of networks of nature that provide um, some of the resilience and uh, shade and flood protection and some of the health benefits that we need from nature. So that's, I mean, some of the exciting stuff and figuring out how we design that with um, as we design our cities to hold more people, um, I think that's there's there's a lot of potential there. Um, the rivers and creeks and wetlands all have have um, there's many many opportunities there. If you want to get involved, I think these themes are probably true almost everywhere. Um, and there tend to be organizations that are working either on the rivers, on wetlands. Um, or even in the habitats within the urban areas. Uh, in California, there's California Native Plant Society. Um, you know, nationally, there's the Nature Conservancy, of course. But then there are also, um, you know, Audubon Backyard Birds. Uh, if you want to collect data and input, the bird is really fun to input um, your own observations about birds uh, into this global database that we actually use quite a bit for our research. Um, so there's there's lots of ways to get involved. Um, simply supporting the, um, you know, the, at the ballot box, the measures to protect parks and make new parks and, um, you know, uh, uh, conservancies. Those are those are what fund most of this work. So um, they're really important. 
thank you for that. And sorry, I have one more question, yeah. which is you mentioned briefly carbon sequestration, and um, I've read some extraordinary numbers on the importance of salt marshes for that. Can you talk briefly about the importance of restored areas for carbon sequestration? Yeah, that, that's really a growing area is um, – is, is understanding those investments in carbon storage in the ecosystem. And I think that is a really, that's a whole other important dimension. Some of the science is a little complex, so, um, of how, how much different wetlands store in different situations. Um, freshwater marshes can store quite a bit. Um, there's some complexities in those, um, because a certain amount of methane can be released at times. But, um, yeah, those are huge, uh, obviously, tens of feet of peat storing a massive amount of carbon. So if we can, that's probably going to be one of the drivers for restoration in the future. Um, in fact, it is a driver for urban forest um, uh, work um, right now through cap and trade funds in California that support planting urban forest um, in part because of their carbon sequestration ability. And interestingly, native oaks are one of the, the biggest um Store some of the store carbon more than almost any other tree um, that's planted in the urban forest. So, yeah, um, riparian corridors, oak woodlands, um, and that's some of the science going on right now is how to how to quantify that and be able to you know essentially market that to the to the global market so that we can be investing in those systems uh, for their carbon storage. Well, thank you so much for your work in our world, and thank you for being on the program, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Robin Grossinger. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.